From our studios in Princeton, New Jersey, here's what we're sharing today on Writers to Writers. We'll cover the do's and don'ts to writing a spellbinding young adult novel. We'll also get tips from authors and illustrators at the Princeton Children's Book Festival, and we'll offer an action plan for marketing your book. It's all coming up right now. Hello, I'm Keith Fritz, and I hope you have your pen and paper handy because today's show is filled with notes. And I'm Jennifer Sneed, and I've got mine ready to take some notes I as well. I know you are. I've got a background in, in marketing, so I'm True. really looking forward to hearing some more marketing expert tips today. How and about you know, well, you, Keith? especially since my students are always reading young adult mm -hmm. literature, I'm definitely interested in today's young adult segment. Good, good. So, as usual, we start off with our Writer's Reveal segment. We have an interesting one for you today. We asked writers to share about a criticism that they've received, either good or bad, and what they'd like to say to their critic. Go ahead, check it out. From a writer friend, came after maybe my third book. After she's finished reading it, she said, I love the story, it was great, but you head hop more than anybody I've ever seen, and somehow it still works. And I did not know what head hopping meant, but she explained it, and to her, I would say thank you. This one reviewer said, it was a good story, but the ending was predictable. And all romances have a happy ending. So I really didn't quite get that. Of course it was predictable. It's a romance. I did get a critique from an agent once for a young adult novel who said that the character was annoying. Um, and I just wanted to say that she's a teenage girl. <laughs> Oh, Jennifer, you know, I have to confess, I've never received a negative comment ever. Okay, obviously that's not true, but I did receive one. I brought it with me. Here we go. Quote, a very unenjoyable book written by a very sick individual. She, she, has no grasp of reality or the real world and should be evaluated for mental instability. Ooh. Fortunately... That's uh, Amazon knows that you're not allowed to say things about the author. Mm. You have to stick to the book itself. So I was able to get that one removed. Wow. Well, <laughs> that, is a, that is a tough critique, <laughs> non-critique right there. Yeah. Uh, Apparently but, I'm a woman. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, we, you know, I would say that critique, good feedback, right, is very helpful to a writer. I know that I've received um, feedback in the past. I can maybe tend to be a little wordy when I write. And okay. So, so advice that I received that was, you know, very helpful critique was to shorten, make it sweeter to the okay. point. So that's been very yeah. helpful to me. I could see that. And obviously I learned that uh, not everybody knows what their, their genre is. This is not a person who was right. ready to read a horror book. So right. it's not always going to be something you need to take to heart. They're not, not all that bad. Not ready. We'd actually love to hear your answers as well. Share with a critique that you've received and what you'd like to say to that person. Here are all the ways that you can connect with us. With the popularity of young adult novels, more and more writers are making the switch. Unfortunately, they don't always understand what makes one genuinely good. So our next guest has assembled what we think is a pretty helpful list for you to consider. Here to share her insights on writing for the young adult market is Jennifer Walkup, a creative writing teacher and author of Second Verse. Welcome, Jennifer. Thank you for joining us today. Let's start with one of the first uh, points on your list. You, you mentioned, young, to, to remind folks, that young adult is a genre and not a reading level. Elaborate a little bit. Right. I think one of the most um, important things for people to remember when they're writing for teens is it's not going to be a less than adult book. It's not something that's not written as well. It's not something that um, you're going to dumb down the text or you're going to use simple words. Um, do not underestimate teen readers. They're really, really smart and they can handle I teach them. Anything. I totally yes. understand what <laughs> yes, you're talking about. They're very, about. very smart. <laughs> uh, how important is voice when it comes to young adult stories? I think voice is probably the absolute most important thing. Okay. Um, and it's not the easiest thing to master. Um, no. And this is one of the things that makes writing for young adults actually um, more difficult than a lot of people think when they come to us a lot for you know beginning young adult writers they're mm -hmm. thinking that they're going to just jump into writing for kids and that it's easy but um, being authentic is something that teens will they will just grab it right away if they open a book and it doesn't sound like an authentic teen they're not going to keep reading it 
Right. Yeah. <laughs> you, you mentioned pace, that mm -hmm. pace is very, you know, important, um, but it, that it moves quickly in young mm -hmm. adults. Right. So t tell us a little bit more about that. Why does it move so quickly? Yeah, pacing, I mean, so young adult books are, I mean, in general, they are a little bit shorter on average, um, but mostly the pacing in young adult book, it has to grab you right away. It's not, um, there's not a lot of of that setup that you have a Getting lot, yeah, in, in the in the adult world. books, and and especially with so many ebooks and so many, you know, read the first few pages here online, yeah. and you know, sometimes you have a page or two, sometimes you have a paragraph or two to grab them, and if you don't, they're clicking on to the next thing. So, Got it. okay. Mm -hmm. You also mentioned the importance of dialogue, and that's obviously different than voice, but can you also let us know how, not only what the difference is, but obviously why that's so important to get the dialogue right. Sure. Um, yes. Yeah, so again, it goes back to that authentic sounding teen. And um, okay. but the difference with the dialogue is, is I always tell people to try to spend time talking to teens, listening to teens. You know, not that's not to say all teenagers sound the same. Certainly they don't, but um, they sound a lot different than you know, those of us who are way past our young adult years, you know, trying to remember or just trying to research it. So and I it's think really important. Remembering what we sounded like, we get it wrong. Our memories are messed <laughs> up and we end up turning our own memories into stereotypes. So that's, right. it's important to listen and Absolutely. get it right. Absolutely. And it's one of those things too, We I will hear um, the teenagers that I teach, a lot of times they'll say um, that it sounds like an adult trying to sound like a teen rather yes. than a real teen. So that's that. kind of what you have to hit. <laughs> You do make the point that young adult novels, the primary target is young adults. Yeah. But talk to us a little bit more about, about that variation. Right. So, um, yeah, so obviously the target age group is young adults, which is between 12 and 18 typically. But research shows that actually that's about half of the readership, and the other half is usually like the 30-year-old demographic, um, mm -hmm. uh, men and women, but mostly, mostly awesome. women. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what about getting teens to comment on what you've written. Yeah, I mean, it's important. I mean, just like with any book you write, you should always try to get some readers in your target audience to kind of read for you. Um, so I always try to have at least a handful of teen readers to read to read my work and make sure that I'm, you know, doing what I need to do. Okay, so <laughs> making sure that your target audience actually has, you know, some say in... Absolutely, yeah. absolutely, because they will call you out on things that just aren't, Sometimes you know, much exactly faster right. than adults would <laughs> yes. as well. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, <laughs> and they like being involved, you know, yeah, and, it's, and it's nice yeah. to actually have, you know, have your target audience actually reading at yeah. an early stage. <laughs> and you note, as the author of Young Adult, you should be reading a lot of Young Adult yourself. That's yes. what you... Absolutely a lot. Why I mean, a, a, you know... I mean, it gets you in, again, the voice and the dialogue and all that stuff of, of the teen books, but there's also, it, it put, just puts you in that world kind of again, if that makes sense, um, you know, and, and just kind of going through all of it, you know, I mean, and, and I always say to go, go to the library, go to the bookstore, take out everything, you know, because there is, you know, The Fault in Our Stars and, and um, you know, Hunger Games and Twilight and all those kind of there's popular ones. They're very different from one another. Absolutely, yeah. but some people that don't know about young adult, they think that's all young adult is. Uh, but right, there is right. actually, I mean, there's so much good young adult put out every year from the really quiet literary books to the blockbuster, you know, the so blockbuster. Sure so you're absorbing all different A little bit areas. of everything, yeah, mm -hmm. a little bit of everything. So would you say that there are definitive subgenres of young adults? Uh, there definitely are. I mean, I think just as much as um, is an adult, um, you know, everything from fantasy and, um, you know, the realistic fiction, of course, paranormal, romance, but there's also humor and there's action and there's horror and, you Are know, there any everything. that stand out that are a little bit more popular in young adult as a compared I think it, like, adults? depends, you know. I think there's, there's waves of it, you know. Um, really popular right now is, like, the realistic um, contemporary fiction. Okay. That's kind of what's kind of happening now with The Fault in Our Stars and If I Stay. All the ones that have been made into movies this year, and yeah. they're kind of making that trend go. So vampires are fading a little bit right now? For now, they well, are until, until the next thing. They'll never go away completely. Until yeah. the next yeah. thing, absolutely. Leave. Absolutely. <laughs> now, you remind us that no topic is off limits for young adults. Right. Why yeah, is that? That's absolutely true. And and also um, even just writing styles too, you know, a lot of people think that again that teens can't heavy you know, handle heavy topics. And they absolutely can. You know, um, there's a lot of books dealing with, I mean, really heavy topics, you know, addiction and and body issues and, you know, suicide and and really heavy things, um, family issues, abuse, you know, there's all those kind of things that don't really seem like 
children's, you know, teen book topics, but they absolutely are. And again, they can handle it. And sometimes you're reaching those readers who really need, you know, really need their stories. And they get it at that age versus, right. you know, much absolutely. younger it wouldn't be. Now, you also have the exact opposite problem, which is authors who think that every young adult story needs to teach some kind of a moral lesson. But right. that's not necessarily <laughs> true either. Right. No, not necessarily. Um, a lot of people do think that. And a lot of, especially beginning writers, think that. They set out, sometimes before they even know their plot, they know what lesson they want to teach. Okay. And um, again, Again, teens will grab that so fast as preaching yep. and just something that they're not interested in reading. What I always do and what I always suggest writers do is to um, just tell your story, get your character, get your voice right. And at the end of your draft or your five, fifth draft or tenth draft or whatever, yes. you may, um, you know, a lesson, you know, something might come out of it organically. And at that point, you can kind of start, you know, teasing out other you know, things thematically to, to speak to it. Okay. I like that. That's good yes. advice. Yes. <laughs> thank you so much oh, for being thank here. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, there's a lot of quick information. Very useful. <laughs> thank you. We sent out two correspondents, Avni Mahaji and Eileen O'Donnell Lennox, to the Princeton Children's Book Festival, where they met some amazing illustrators and authors. Here's a look at the advice and tips that were shared. Thank you, Jen and Keith. And here we are at the Princeton Children's Book Festival. We're here with Lisa Klein Ransom, who will be sharing five tips on the Dialogue for Children's book. Lisa, how are you today? I'm great, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having, thank you for being here. Um, let's start with tip number one. So tip number one for me is you should always vary sentence structure. Mm -hmm. You have to have a variety of sentences within the book to make it interesting and creative. Okay, so, so dialogue is action. Does that... Is vivid um, pictures more descriptive and more satisfying to our readers, especially a child? Absolutely, yes. I think it really brings the book to life. Gotcha. Yes. And tip number two. Tip number two is to read. Uh -huh. I think that's the most important tip of all five. Yeah. Um, I think all writers read a lot. And by reading, you gather a greater understanding of um, how dialogue is created, how plots developed, how characters are formed. So those things are really important. Yeah. And on to our tip number three. You should listen to the way your characters speak. Um, you should really be always listening to people when you're at the dinner table and when you're at school. Listen to the way people speak and then give that same information and same attention to detail to your own characters when you're writing dialogue. Okay. And how do you describe emotion? Do you do it with dialogue in a sense of action? Do you do it in a sense of um, vivid pictures? What's... what's um, What's a good dialogue for a child to understand an emotion? Well, I mean, what writers always say is you should show and not tell. So you really have to um, engage the reader by using descriptive language mm -hmm. and drawing them in that way rather than saying uh, perhaps uh, this person was angry or this okay. person was sad. Show them through the words and through the dialogue that you're using. Yeah. So for our viewers out there, listen and read. Uh, on to our tip number four. Tip number four is to really know your characters. Mm -hmm. Know what they would say so that when you're writing and when you're looking at dialogue, each person should have a very distinct um, speech pattern. Okay. So you don't always have to use qualifiers like Bob said or Sally said. You should know it's Bob or Sally mm -hmm. just by the way in which the characters, or the words the characters use and the way in which they speak. Mm -hmm. Is it okay for a reader not to know exactly what's going on at every single moment? Is that okay? No, I think, yeah, I think it's good to just hang on sometimes and you'll find out in the end. It could be unveiled very slowly. Okay. And on to our tip number five, our last tip. Last tip is read your writing aloud. Um, in my household, I take my writing and I go read it to my husband, to my kids, to my dog. I read it to everyone in the household so that I can hear what it sounds like and I can get feedback about my writing. Thank you so much, Lisa. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Hi, Jennifer and Keith. I'm here at the Princeton Children's Book Festival with Wendell Miner, and Wendell's going to tell us the five top tips for an illustrator who's working with a writer. Hello, Wendell. How are you? And I'm sure there are far more than five. Uh, but number one, uh, working with a writer, I like to break all the rules and actually get to know the writer and have their input, because I think that's very important, is to understand what the writer has in mind and uh, really just work to that end just so that you, you, you come together as, as, a, as, as a co collaborators and create a better book that way, I believe. That's fantastic. What would another tip be? Well, I think to, to uh, when I worked with Gene Craighead George, we did 
um, 22 books in 18 years. And Gene and I would talk about ideas initially of what we were going to do next. And when we finished our book Everglades, she said, we're going to the Arctic. And so we started talking about what we could do about polar uh, stories about polar bears. And then I would go to Jean's house and we'd actually sit down and I would sketch. She would write, show me the manuscript, and I would do sketches with her. And we would begin to form the book that way. It's, it, it, it's, it's a process that I've always really enjoyed. And I think, really, it does make for a better book. So collaboration is very important. I, I believe it is. Uh, some publishers feel that authors and illustrators should never meet. Uh, but I've always broken that rule. <laughs> Can you give us a third tip? Third tip is to know your material, to do your research. Uh, if you're doing a book on penguins, you have to learn all about penguins. If it's about bears, I did a book with Gene George on Galapagos George the tortoise. I read, I read a lot of background material. I do a lot of photo research. I go to the place uh, whenever I can uh, and understand what the environment is and the creatures that I'm painting. That is something that I owe the child. I want them to realize that when I paint something, it's accurate and they should know it as well as I mean for them to know it. So research, research, research. Absolutely. And like drawing? Draw, draw, and draw some more. Uh, you can never be good enough. You're always practicing. You're always trying to get better. And I've been, I'm on my 55th book and I'm still trying to learn how to paint, frankly. <laughs> I doubt that, but number four? Number four, um, I think to follow through, I always like to keep my editors apprised of the progress of my book, and I don't have any problem with emailing each piece as I finish it so that they can see it, they see the progress, and also, if there's anything wrong with that particular painting, I'll know about it right away and I can correct it right away. So when I deliver a complete book, there are no changes, and I've been, I've been very lucky in that regard. I, that sounds pretty rare. Now, what is your final tip? I think the final step is when you do your presentations, your complete book. Now, I'm a book designer, too, so I present a complete book from cover to cover, title page to the copyright page. But have a comprehensive dummy that has no doubt that it's what your intentions are. If you do a scribble dummy and all of a sudden you do a finished painting that doesn't look like what the editor had in mind or the art director had in mind, then the, the separation of those two points create problems. So I like to do very tight tonal studies so that there's no question about what my intentions are. And I don't think I've had more than three changes in 55 books. That's fantastic. Yeah, and I think it's a question of always assuming uh, for yourself that you should do everything you possibly can do to make things clear and simple and making your editor and your author's job much simpler that way. I learned a lot. Thank you so much for You're taking the time. Much. Thank you for having me. Hundreds of thousands of new book titles are published each year, so knowing how to stand out in this crowded marketplace is key. And joining us with some tips and techniques to do just that is marketing expert Sandra Smith, president of Smith Publicity. Sandra, thank you so much for coming. Wonderful to be here. Thank you. Uh, our struggling writers who are looking to you know, learn a lot about uh, the marketing area, uh, is there something that they can learn, a, that, that's something they should be doing first before they finish writing their books? Sure. What I love working with authors for many, many years are authors who have a target in mind. Why do I want to write this book? Who am I writing it for? One of the biggest mistakes that authors make, my book is great for everyone. Well, it's not. No, no it's, not. it's never true. <laughs> no, so if, if you can really focus on why I'm writing this book, especially for nonfiction, who do I want to impress? Who am I trying to reach? Why am I doing this? It's going to make writing the book and then marketing the book so much more focused and more effective. Right. Makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. So this day and age, social media is very important, mm -hmm. but it can be a little bit overwhelming and very time consuming. So do you have any suggestions uh, for writers to make sure that they're targeting um, you know, the, right, the right areas for them? Absolutely. It's quality over quantity. So make sure you're comfortable, whether it's Twitter, Facebook, Google Plus, 
Um, LinkedIn, again, depending on your target audience, is the social media network that you really want to focus on. So if you're a business person, LinkedIn probably makes more sense than Facebook. Facebook is typically friendly for novelists, but Twitter by far is the number one social media network for authors. And that's because with the hashtags, you can join conversations that are far reaching outside of your friend network. So yeah. you can really build conversations and network with people beyond your current world. World. Okay. And with social media, the number one engagement for authors, do not friend someone, follow someone, and then try to sell your book. You really mm -hmm. want to develop authentic yes. relationships, give Absolutely. good content, and your book is there in the background. But I just on LinkedIn last week, someone friended me, I accepted, and then an email, mm -hmm. come and buy my book. Not a yeah, good thing. No good thanks. rules, good rules. Okay, so what about when you do want to go out and market? You have, you know, your connections on those platforms. Mm -hmm. Now it's time to actually do the marketing. Yes. Is there a first step, a second step? Or are there several things you need to do at once? Sure. Your website is key. You okay. want to make sure that you have a robust website with about the author, about the book, how to contact the author. The number one trick or inside secret for authors' websites, collect email addresses. Mm. You want to make sure that you have a way to interact with this very important audience. Um, so you want to do a newsletter and you want, again, it's all about content you don't want to sell. You want to talk about your passions, your book, that why are you writing, whether you're an expert in finance or whether you have the latest novel about you know, the Jersey Shore. There's many different ways that you can connect content. So that's something you want to do is make sure you have a great website. The other is your Amazon page, you, especially if you're self-published. Mm -hmm. You want to make sure your Amazon page looks as complete as possible. With professional. A, professional, sure. yes. Uh, please, please have a book <laughs> cover. Sometimes it's this image. You're you right. want a book Ooh. cover. You want a professional author photo, a full bio, um, a book description, and beg your friends, family, your mailman to put up reviews about your book. That is key. You want people to, if you're going to drive the media, whether it's a newspaper um, editor, a, a TV host, sure. to want to invite you, you want to see something that is already in progress, not a budding author as much right. as possible. Right. Yeah, I know the uh, the email address thing. I've heard that a big deal. <laughs> Having an email list as an author, it's Very hard important. to get, but that's it's, a great piece of advice. Extraordinarily valuable, yes. yes. Yeah. Now, we know that authors sometimes overlook the use of a media kit. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us the importance of a media kit and sort of what they should be putting into that kit? Sure. What, what we like to see, um, a couple of different things. One is a press release or information about the book. Why is it different? Why it's unique? What you learned from it? And why I'm qualified to write this book? Because you need to s separate yourself. There are thousands of books coming out every oh, single yeah. day. Yeah. So why so, go to you? Yeah, right. so, why, so, so you want to, you gotta, you gotta get to the point quickly. The other piece that we like to do is a release we call an interview release. It's all about mm -hmm. the author. No one wants to talk to a book. You want okay, to talk to someone true. who's engaging, Correct. who has something to share with your audience, passionate, ed educational, maybe a bit, um, as, as you both know, um, against conventional wisdom, right. uh, a bit shocking, new information to share with audiences. So it's all about content and why you are uniquely qualified to share this with your potential readers or It's or about the listeners. person behind the story. They exactly. get to like you as a person, yeah. and then, then they're they going to be interested in your stories. So exactly, like exactly. Yeah. So that's what we like to see in a media kit is about the book, why it's different, and then really a little bit deeper about the author and the expertise or the research if it's a novel. Why should you listen to me? Okay. Right. Now, this is, to me, it's been one of the hardest things to get over. Uh, you can do all these things online and it's, you know, you don't have to see people face to face, but mm -hmm. then there are those moments when somebody says, oh, you're a writer, tell me about your book, and you have to do <laughs> the pitch. Yes. Can you please give some advice to people who have not done much work on it yet? Sure. I send authors to look at movie one-liners. Okay. I think it's fantastic. You go see, you, you see movies in one line, you know exactly, boy meets girl on ship that sinks. You know, or <laughs> Titanic. <laughs> exactly. But you know, you can be, but look, look at that um, at movie descriptions. You want to do a one-line educational novel for children, bringing in travels, adventure, and 
ecology. And that's one of the clients we're working with right now is this book series. One line, because you really only have a couple of seconds yeah, couple to get seconds. people. Yeah. Even the 30 second elevator speech is too long. Wow. You know, yeah. like they, like, you know, they, they say not, like, you, you, YouTube videos shouldn't be more than two minutes, and that's right. even long today. Yeah. So Vines are six seconds long. Exactly. Yeah. So that's the, in the changing media landscape, you've got to get to the point. So get your book and practice. Okay. Before we go, are there any tips, um, common mistakes that authors make um, in marketing themselves inappropriately or not at all or that they overlook when they're trying to market themselves? Yes. Well, first of all, definitely get professional editing on your book. And that is even before you market it. Because if you have a book out heard there, that one before. <laughs> if you don't have a professionally edited book, right. no matter what the topic is, how relevant, how great the expert, no one's going to take you seriously. So that is key. From a marketing perspective, some authors... Um, will call us and say, hi, I want to be a New York Times bestseller next week. Can you get me on the Today <laughs> Show? Can you get me on Oprah? Right. You get to pay your dues. You know, yeah. you, I, I equate, it, equate it to baseball. You don't start off in the major leagues. You don't start right. off in the World Series. Right. You start off in the Little League. And so you, it takes time. You look at any household name author today. Don't look at what they're doing this week. Look at what they did 10 years ago. And uh, you, you yes. got to put, you got to put your time in. Don't overlook small media markets and bloggers. Very important to building your platform and then opening up the door to the next level. Great. Wow. We, we Excellent really advice. appreciate all of this information thank you so much, Sandy. for authors to help promote. Oh, thank you for having thank me. You. This is great. I'm here at the Princeton Children's Book Festival and we're here with James Ransom. How are you, James? I'm very good. And James will be discussing it with us the top five business illustrating tips for our viewers out there. So let's start with tip number one. First, um, tip number one is agent or no agent. It's really a tough call. I would suggest everyone start off on their own first. And then once you get a sense of the business and how it works, then maybe you, have an, you should get an agent. But then um, if you feel, once you get to know people in the business, then you can sort of move away from your agent if you feel comfortable. But some people really feel more comfortable with an agent because they don't like doing that themselves. So get an agent. Tip number two. Um, the Graphic Artists Guild is a great source. There's a book that they print every year, has um, um, contracts, um, lots of information about other places you can come, you can contact to get information. But I would recommend getting a, a copy of the Graphic Artists Guild um, booklet. Okay. Booklet number two. On to our tip number three. Um, the next tip would be SCBWI, the Society of Children's Books Writers and Illustrators. I would recommend you join your local um, group. They often re meet at Barnes and Nobles. Um, it's a, a, fun, a wonderful place to um, sort of uh, meet people who are just starting to get into business. There's usually someone there who's been in the business for a while and give you lots of good insight and information about how to get published, how to um, work with contracts, and uh, other tips. So I would strongly recommend joining the SCBWI. On to our next tip. Um, the next tip is showing your portfolio. Um, you, well, no one really shows a portfolio anymore. Most of, everyone has a website now. You want to make, make sure your website is up to date. It's easy to navigate. And the most important thing, your email address should be easily accessible. I just went to a, a, a young student's um, website yesterday. And it was a fill-in form that I had to fill in to do a, go to her website, which drives most people really crazy. So you just want to make just a, just a website address so they can contact you. And on to our last and final tip. Um, the last and final tip would, would be, um, uh, we talked about showing your portfolio, about mailers. The, the way you get work is to actually send out postcards. Um, and that sort of tells people, it's like you're advertising. We all get those, those cards in the mail, tell us to come to the large stores and the small stores to buy different things. Well, as an illustrator, you have to do the same thing. You basically have to send your cards out to publishers so they can see what you're doing and what your style is. And based on that, they will go to your website, see more of your work, and then they will contact you and offer your project. Thank you so much. And back to you. Thanks so much for spending this time with us. We'll see you next time for more Writers to Writers. <laughs>